controlling our destination, that's when divine appointments occur. And see, this week for our missions team has been a week full of divine appointments. Divine appointments, connections. And that's how the kingdom of God works, is it doesn't work being a Lone Ranger. The last time I checked, I didn't see anybody thriving that wasn't part of a fellowship and connected to the body of Christ. See, we need to be in fellowship, yes. holding each other accountable. We need to be there for the prayer meeting, not just the worship service when we shout, amen. That's where a church is built. Yes. Sunday worship is a great time of celebration and giving glory to God yes. and celebrating what he's done in and through us and yes. what he continues to do. But the church is built on the prayer meeting. The church is built on our knees. Yes. The church is built where we lay on our face before God and cry out and say, God, I need you. Move. See, we all have some mountains in our life that need to be moved, but sometimes we're not willing to get close enough and we still have to have that piece of control. And you know what? That's been the hardest lesson learned over the last 20 years is how I need to lose control in order to gain control. Because when he has all control, when he has all control, he will take us from Glory to glory to glory. And everything we put our hands to will be blessed at that moment. But but I know in my culture, and I'm seeing it more and more over the years as I've been here, is that sometimes we've got some control issues, preachers. We we all want we all want to control how God moves. We're not willing to just recklessly lay our lives down and say, it's all about you, yeah. not about me. Yeah. See, John 3.30 is one of those powerful, powerful verses. A little verse. It says, let me decrease so that you can increase. See, we want God to increase, amen? amen. But in order for him to increase, we need to go through the refiner's fire. We need to go all the way into the river of God. And as we go all the way into the river of God, he will move those mountains. He will restore broken relationships. He will save and deliver that son that you've been praying for for years. He will pull him up out of the muck in the miry clay and set his feet on a solid rock which Christ stands. See, he's able. And see, I know for me, I had a praying grandmother. I had a praying grandmother that, that, that went to bed with her Bible. And, and when I, I got her Bible after she passed away, it had tear stains all through it. The pages were almost falling out because she cried out for God for years, for God to deliver me. That why was I walking in such darkness when I knew better? But see, God is faithful. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we could ever hope or ask for. He's just asking for us to move a little closer. He wants us to go all in. Not just Sunday morning, but all in. He wants us to raise up a generation. That's what's beautiful about this place. There is a generation that is going to be equipped. A generation that's going to be raised up that will birth a fire that can't go out, a fire that burns deep and long, and on each side of the river, there will be fruit that produces a harvest 30, 60, even 100 fold, and he will pour out his blessing upon the youth, and as the youth rise up and take authority, not be put down, Come on. See, Timothy, this is, a, I'm going someplace, Pastor. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Timothy 4.12, tells it like this. First Timothy says this. That's all right. That, that was good. It says this. You, listen to this. This, this is a, a word of knowledge for you. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith yes. and in purity. Yes. See, you guys can be different 
peacemakers. Because here's the thing I had to learn. I got out of all that stuff. God miraculously set me free from a prison cell on June 15, 1997. I never returned to the vomit. I don't need to be like the fool in the folly or the dog that returns to his vomit because I'm a child of the one true king. And God has called me and set me apart for his purposes, for his works. And I'm willing to go wherever he says, including a mountain in Pennsylvania, a long, long way from my beach town that I grew up in. My wife sometimes wonder why we're up in that mountain. But it's for a purpose and for a plan. And it's been a place, place of empowering and a place of drawing nearer to God. It's been a place of comfort and restoration as God has done some miraculous works and some relationships in our family. And in this, I've learned as he pulled me up and out. Initially, he took me back to my hometown. And everybody was watching. I would walk down the street and people would walk to the other side of the street because they had heard that I was no longer the Billy Frick that I used to be when I lived in darkness. See, my previous life, I had managed the biggest clubs in my town. I managed bars and nightclubs, and I lived all in for the devil. But see, God had a praying grandmother, and had some people that I had come to know the Lord Jesus that were his vessels and agents that helped pull me up and out of the miry clay and introduce me to this Lord Jesus Christ God. that God. is so wonderful. wonderful. And I put me in a place of Bible-believing, spirit-filled place of worship. Now, let me let you in on something. Spoiled little rich kid, grew up in the Catholic Church. All I knew was the, the rules and the regulations. I, I knew all the prayers, but it wasn't transforming. That first time I walked into that Pentecostal church, and, and Sister Diana was there, and Mark was probably there. It was one of them Wednesday night, like old school, like it should have been sawdust on the floor, preacher. Where the power of God would show up and they would be worshiping for hours. And I'm standing at the back wall. <laughs> and I remember seeing a lady go forward for prayer and boom, the power of God came on her. And I'm going, ain't somebody going to help her? <laughs> and I wish I could say that that first night I got saved and it all became wonderful, but... But my analytical mind wouldn't allow me to connect with what God was doing at that moment. But I was drawn because the people of God, there was something different about those people. And the difference was the power of the Holy Ghost flowing through them. Like Romans 15, 13 says that the God of hope will fill us with all peace and joy as we trust in him so that by it we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And those people were living, breathing testimonies of Romans 15, 13. And because of those people who came alongside me, they didn't tell me as a sheep to clean up and then come in the house of God. I came in stinking and messy. Tore up. And half the time I came in there high as a kite not knowing what I was doing in church. And you know what? In the early days that the preaching got bored, I went to the bathroom and did some things I'm not too proud of. But I kept coming. Because I saw people's lives that were living the gospel. Living the good news of Jesus Christ. Living and walking it out. I heard people stand up and say things like, I'm 30 years old, I've never been married, and I'm pure. I'm waiting for my husband. You know what? I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for 12 years. Do you know how many people I get to marry that come to me like that? Maybe one out of 10. All right. <laughs> and these are church folk. Because sin has entered the camp. And it only takes a little leaven to spool the whole loaf. See, we need to get back to that old school holiness type movement where I am holy, so you be holy, says the Lord God Almighty in Leviticus 19. But today, sometimes.
sometimes we just, we, we want to do our church thing and then we want to live a little bit like the world. We want all the, all, all, all the things and all the comforts. But see, God wants to set us apart. And when we're set apart, young people, that's when you become true difference makers. And here's the thing I've learned. Many times it's not been with the words that I've spoken, but it's been the life that I've lived. And the same people that condemned me, cursed me, told me I was a fake, every one of them, when they've gone through something, they turn to me. And I've just been available because I speak life, light, and blessing. See, there's power in the tongue. Our tongue can speak life, light, and blessings, or it can speak curses, death, and disobedience. What do we want to speak? We want to speak life, amen? And young people, get this down in your spirit. Don't let people put you down because you're young. God can use you right where you are. My 10-year-old, who I believe has the gift and anointing of healing, when he prays for people, stuff happens, man. People go back for PET scans and CAT scans and their cancer is gone. Amen. And see, God is using him because he's humble. Because it's all he knows. And he doesn't allow the traps of the enemy to consume him. He doesn't allow to just go a little bit in. He's all in. Because he wants to see God bring another Pentecost. Send the fire today. See, there was a move of God right before I got saved in Brownsville, in, in Pensacola, Florida. The evangelist, the, the late, great Steve Hill, was the evangelist there. And he was also a graduate of Teen Challenge, which I am a graduate of. And he, he went there on Father's Day. And Father's Day in churches, a lot of times in our culture, is not a real big day. It's not like Mother's Day. Everybody show up in church on Mother's Day, amen? Yeah. Right. But Father's Day, they have a cookout. And church ain't part of the cookout. They, they might throw some horseshoes or might go play golf or something. But, but church ain't part of the equation. So he was the evangelist invited on Father's Day. And he, he, he told the story that he had a real bad attitude head to that church service. He's like, why am I in this monstrous structure that's going to be half empty on Father's Day to bring forth the word? My God. And what happened on Father's Day 1996, I believe, or 95, the wind came through like a rushing mighty wind. And the power of God fell and people didn't leave church at 6 o'clock at night. They were still on their face, yes. praising and worshiping God. And that's one of the modern day revivals. And I trace my spiritual roots to that revival because the leadership from the Assemblies of God Church that I got saved in had been down there as a group. And then they brought in, okay, we're going to have our little pretty revival, three-day revival. You know what I'm talking about, Pastor. Yes. We're going to bring the evangelist in, and he's going to challenge everybody to get right, or they're going to be left. How many How many of you know you need to be right? Yes. Or you're going to be left, and you don't want to be left. Amen? Yes. So we bring in the evangelist. He's supposed to be there for three days, and, and I'm in that process where I'm, I'm not sanctified yet. I haven't even said yes to the Lord yet. I'm not even carrying the right Bible yet. <laughs> I had... True story. I'm, th I'm throwing Pastor Tim under the bus. <laughs> It'll get back to him and I'll pay for it, but it's worth it. When I got to church, all the people had these pretty nice leather study Bibles. And, and, and American, they were about $80 American, which would be a, about 160J, right? No, no. Uh, $80 so would be about $8,000. Huh? $80,000J. $8,000J. $8,000J. A lot of money. So I went to the Christian bookstore and I saw that. And I said, no way, Jose. <laughs> so I went to a yard sale and I found a Bible. And I paid a quarter for it, but I bought a pack of lies. I bought the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures, the Jehovah's Witness Bible. <laughs> and I started carrying that Bible because I wanted to be like them people so bad. I had my highlighter. I had my notebook. I'd be underlining it. I'd be writing in it. But then I would go to the pastor and say, Pastor Tim, I'm an educated mind. And my Bible doesn't read like your Bible. And he would say, he didn't give me a Bible. 
Bible, he 